Hey yo everyone, bugs and glitches have always plagued video games, and if recent releases are any indicator, will likely continue to be a problem within the industry for years to come. Sometimes these bugs can be comical or just flat out fun to mess around with. On the other hand, some of these software hiccups can lead to the whole game crash. As traumatizing as these crashes are, there was actually one crash that stands head and shoulders above all the others. The great video game crash of 1983 sent an entire generation of game developers into bankruptcy and nearly toppled the video game industry completely. And that's not an exaggeration. The years 1983 to 1985 were basically the Great Depression for video games. As I mentioned in my Generation 2 video, which now feels like it came out forever ago, video games were on the rise in the early 80s. It was still very much a niche market, but growing at a rapid pace. So rapid, in fact, that it just couldn't sustain itself and imploded from the oversaturation of bad games. Everyone and their grandma was clamoring to break into the gaming industry to make a quick buck regardless of whether or not they were qualified to do so, and because of that, many game studios began prioritizing quantity over quality. The great video game crash is incredibly important to the legacy of video games, so in this video, I want to talk about the crash and how we almost lost the gaming industry completely. If you enjoy the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Alright, let's get it. The 80s was a magical time filled with rocky movies, rollerblades, and an immeasurable amount of fear of nuclear fallout. It was also the beginning of the home console expansion to the common American household. In the early 80s, home video game consoles were on the rise. Just like your mother, consoles were becoming cheaper and more accessible, which led to more and more sales. Because of the rapid surge in sales for home video game consoles, tons of other tech companies wanted to hop into the industry and sell their own branded console. In the year 2024, there are only a handful of major platforms that people will play on, but back in the early 80s, there were dozens of consoles to choose from. Because of this, the young gaming industry was very segmented. Remember the console wars of the 2000s? Every sweaty nerd basically identified themselves with either Xbox or PlayStation. It was toxic, yes, but it unified all gamers under the two banners. And I guess Nintendo was in there somewhere, they've been kind of doing their own thing for a while though. In the 80s, you could hypothetically have a group of like 10 friends and they could all be on different consoles. That's crazy, I can't even imagine having 10 friends. This segmentation made it harder for people to share the same experience among their peers because each console had their own specific controller, exclusive games, and horrible naming schemes. It was also tough for people to find what they were supposed to be buying. Picture parent after parent buying the wrong game for the wrong console. I mean, I can't blame them. Look at some of these names. Interton VC4000, APF a, a Imagination Machine, N N N Nintendo N Entertainment System? Like what? What does that even mean? I can't even pronounce some of these. With a huge lineup of different consoles, shopping for the right one could become a huge undertaking. In modern generations, it's not as bad because if you ask for a video game console from your parents, you have a pretty decent chance of getting either Xbox, PlayStation, or Nintendo. But back in the 80s, yeah, there was no way my parents were going to get the right thing. The problem was, there were too many different consoles, but not any real variation. They were all basically a spin on the same hardware with little actual innovation. This led to a bunch of confusion among consumers back in the 80s, and a bunch of them just said F it and bought their kids a hacky sack or a pack of cigarettes or whatever kids in the 80s did. So besides the dozens of different consoles on the market, it seemed like a bunch of companies were rushing to hop in on this video game fad to try and cash in on a quick buck. And when I say companies, I don't mean Activision or EA or Sega. I don't even mean video game developers who created studios and then failed. No, when I say companies were trying to hop in on the video game fad, I mean companies that have no business at all in the video game industry, like Johnson & Johnson or Kool-Aid or the United States government. I guess at least there's tons of competition, right? Okay, so for some reason a dog food company is producing video games. Maybe it'll at least be interesting. Everyone who worked on this needs to be sent to prison. 
During the early 80s, all video game developers were struggling to compete with each other and ended up rushing game after game in hopes of beating the others out to the market. More games equals more games sold equals more money. With insane turnaround times and employees who may not have been quite qualified to be designing games, many titles skipped the quality assurance step and just shipped them out to stores. Because of this, tons of already horrible games became even worse somehow. There were tons of bugs and glitches in these titles, some were so bad that the game would be literally unplayable. Obviously, if I can't come home after a long day of work and enjoy Revenge of the Beefsteak Tomatoes, then yeah, I'm gonna be pretty pissed off. For a lot of people, this turned them off of video games completely, which I can't really blame them for. Even if a game wasn't completely broken when you bought it, it doesn't mean it was necessarily good. In fact, most of them were flat out shit. I've mentioned before that Nintendo uses a seal of quality on every game that they've ever made or licensed. They did this to establish their brand and also build a reputation of high quality games for their consoles. This originated during the 80s because of all of the other shit games being released. You see, most of the games leading up to the crash were just downright awful. As more and more companies tried to get into the gaming scene, Atari and other industry giants became desperate and started pumping out as many games as they could as fast as possible. Publishers were basically just grabbing whatever garbage they could find on the streets and slapping their logo on it. That's why we have these weird titles on the Atari. This led to a huge surplus of games that were mediocre at best. Have you ever heard of the term shovelware? Well, that originated in this era. Dozens upon dozens of games were eventually just thrown into bins at retailers where customers could dig around and find something that maybe looked interesting. Unfortunately, even if the cover art or description of a game caught someone's eye, the actual content was usually pretty mid, like I said. As a result, a lot of people felt cheated and just quit buying video games. Which leads me to the next factor that contributed to the great crash. Negative word of mouth. In the early 80s, the video game industry was still finding its footing. As a result, there weren't a lot of established media outlets that reliably covered gaming like we have today. We have the luxury of seeing gameplay for ourselves and deciding if we want to spend our money on a game. Back then, people usually learned about what games were good or not by talking through a tin can attached to a string. That and just word of mouth in general. Since most games during this era were bad for the multitude of reasons I listed earlier, people told their friends to skip new titles because they wouldn't be worth their time or money. The two most infamous cases of this were the E.T. and Pac-Man releases for the Atari 2600. As legend has it, these two titles were the tipping point for the industry and were the main catalyst for the great video game crash. They were highly marketed and extremely rushed in order to hit the shelves by Christmas of 82, which is not a great combo. Pac-Man was already incredibly popular at the time in the arcade scene, so after excited people played through the shit show that was the Atari release, people were not happy with the home console industry. If you can't get an American staple like Pac-Man done right, how can you trust publishers to get anything right? As for E.T., well, it was a movie license title. Even today, those games don't usually work out, but this one basically set the gold standard for horrible movie tie-in games. These two games were some of the most purchased titles of the holiday season, and after people experienced how bad these games could be, they soon quit video games completely and encouraged their friends to do the same. To them, they were convinced that these duds were the rule, not the exception of what video games were like. Soon, game sales began to plummet, which was more devastating than you'd expect. I mentioned in my last Gaming Generations video that companies would practice the razor blade model. Essentially, this model was the idea of selling the main attraction for less than its market value and making back that money through add-ons. In this case, it was sell consoles at a loss and make that money back, plus more, through video game sales and licensing. So when video game sales took a nosedive, companies ran out of money. Fast. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Investor after investor pulled out of the industry, which led to a massive collapse in the gaming economy. In 1983, Atari was expecting a profit margin of 50% for their 1982 sales, but instead only made an abysmal 10%. This was disastrous news coming from the then leading industry giant. Up to this point, Atari had basically only seen explosive growth during its lifetime, so to hear its sales cut back so drastically sent a panic throughout the entire industry. This led to a bunch of investors pulling the plug on their gaming department altogether, which then sent more shockwaves to the industry as it suddenly began to collapse from within. 
And just like that, the video game industry had crashed into oblivion, barely hanging on by a thread. The fad of gaming had passed. Games that occupied store shelves across the country just a few weeks ago could now only be found in clearance bins. Consoles were being tossed or sold at rummage sales. Game cartridges became glorified paperweights. It seemed as if this young industry was just beginning to find its way when it fell apart in what is now known as the North American Gaming Recession. But as fate would have it, a video game legend who was destined to save the industry was about to be born across the Pacific from a small playing card company named Nintendo. But that's a story for another video. So obviously there is a lot more to the great video game crash than I could ever cover in this one video, but I hope you enjoyed this little recap of the gaming recession. Even though the gaming industry isn't that old, it still has a rich and fascinating history. I'm super excited to cover the next generation of gaming and tell the story of how Nintendo and Mario basically saved the industry from what seemed like its inevitable doom. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It means a lot. I appreciate you guys as always, and I'll catch you in the next one.